I'm your host, Eric Asante, and today we are spending some time with an old colleague, but a good friend. She has accomplished so much, both personally and professionally. She's currently the senior instructional designer, and we'll learn more about what that is and what goes into that and so forth. I also want to make sure we spend some time on just getting to know who this amazing woman is. Please, without further ado, I know I kept you guys in the dark a little bit about who she is, but you're going to learn more about it. That's why I did that on purpose there. <laughs> but please help me welcome my friend, Sahara Joya. Welcome. Thank How are you? you? Good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. So what I normally start with, with every episode where I have a guest is I start off with a quote and this quote is specifically for you and I want you to share with us um, what comes to mind when you hear it okay and the quote is by Alan Rufus it reads your inner strength is your outer foundation what comes to mind when you hear that mm. Mm. wow Whew. I feel <laughs> that in my heart I feel that in my heart <laughs> Um, I love that. I, I, I envision the warrior um, when I hear that, but lately I've been working with this concept of the dancing warrior. So it's about using joy as your medicine and as your weapon. And I don't really believe in like weapons so much in that sense. But when you said about like the inner strength and the utter, that's what I see. So your reality, the life that you live is a representation of the journey you've taken on an internal level. And so I'm excited for this. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. That's, I, I knew you would enjoy that or appreciate that because of obviously the kind of person that I know you are. And so that's fitting. That was perfect. That was perfect. I want to learn more about that. Like, where did you learn about that concept? In terms of the dancing warrior? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, I actually have a painting of it in my house. I, I painted one myself. Um, and it's a representation of my journey, I would say, but I've heard the concept in, in different areas, and it's also a, a dance move in, like, the Nia art form. Um, yeah, and so for me, it represents a transformation of, and we're going to talk a little bit about the shift of survival to thrival and how that's related as a metaphor, um, but a lot of my life was used to fight. Like, I had to have the warrior energy so that I could survive, and then you get to this place of realizing that you don't want life to just be about survival. You want it to be about thrival. Mm. So what does that look like? Then the warrior shifts from like that wounded warrior to the dancing warrior. So part of that means you do have a healing process to go through, but then life is about joy. So, Wow. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, I have a feeling, and I've had this feeling since the minute I reached out to you, that this conversation is going to mean so much, not just for me, but anybody that comes across it, just because I know how you think. And I enjoyed those conversations we had years ago. Right. And so I know how you think and I know how you look at the world is completely different than most. And so mm -hmm. I feel like you're going to really rattle a lot of people with with a lot of these concepts. And even though they're simple, but it's accepting them i think is what we struggle with often is accepting something that's new and trying it right so i think you're going to really push people to their limits as far as comfort so that they can actually break through that that barrier and kind of get to the uncomfortable spaces and then actually develop and evolve a little bit more so I, i'm looking forward to this one i really am <laughs> now let's go back i want to go back to the beginning of who sahar was um tell me a little bit about your family and and how many siblings do you have Sure. Um, so I am of Afghan descent. Oh, my story starts in Pakistan. I was born in Pakistan. My sister and I were born under like a refugee status. So um, my family fled Afghanistan in the late 70s, literally on like horses and donkeys. Um, I have four, four sisters, two brothers. So my parents had to deal with, you know, carrying their children on horses and donkeys across the mountains to get to the other side. And so it's always been a life of resilience of like starting over, starting over, starting over. Um, and so being Afghan uh, and then being an immigrant in Canada with the whole September 11th, like that was another mark of like identity stuff for me. Um, so 
my start is there and it's always been a close part of my politics and my practice and my why, I guess, because I've had to address a lot of pain um, and a lot of like, you know, things around displacement, things around not belonging, um, which has also fueled my passion for like inclusion and all of that as well. Wow. Now, that's a lot. That's like a separate episode on its own. That that part of your story. <laughs> now, I didn't know that you guys actually went through that with the, you know, escaping it and, and making that trip. But you mentioned something that obviously resonated with me as far as um, 9-11. How did that period impact you personally? Big time, because uh, when it happened is when my parents also had divorced. So we had just moved to like a low income, single mother household neighborhood. And so I was starting out new and I was around 11 or 12 years old. I was in grade seven. And the moment people discovered that, like young kids, you know, they want to make fun of you. They want to create jokes. And so um, people knew that I was of Afghan descent, and so they'd be like, oh, is your dad Osama? Is your dad Osama? And they didn't realize the impact of that on me as a child that was going through, like, the parents having divorced and having to deal with, like, not knowing where my dad was in terms of, like, the separation. So there's, like, the personal element of that one side of your story and then the political of the other. So it was really difficult, I would say. It was really, really difficult because all these narratives came out about what it means to be an Afghan woman. And I had to like challenge those stereotypes and like, you know, dismantle them because people want to read you. So they want to be like, Oh, you look different. Where are you from? And right. you know, <laughs> right. that's, that's part of the Canadian narrative. Right. right? <laughs> Where are you from? You look so different. And then like, right. there'd be some people who are racist and they'd say, go get, go back home. And that was another pain point for me because, you know, I'm like, but, sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. I go for it. Go for it. I can't, I can't even go back home. I've never stepped foot on the lands of your right. I, I still haven't yeah. uh, landed, got, gone back there. So it really had a big impact. Wow. Yeah. I, I, can, I can relate to a degree just because I'm from West Africa. So coming here, I came here when I was 11. And so I went through very similar with the name calling and, and people not you know, identifying you as just a person and they're saying, well, where are you from? You got to be different because you have an accent. And I always found that interesting as I got older, I realized, wait a minute, no one on this land is from here. Except right? for indigenous. Right, folks. right. Like, right. right. So those who are calling us different is what I'm, I'm speaking to. Right. Like they say, oh, you're not from here. You're different. Well, where are you from? Right. And so that's always interesting when, when you actually are older and you have the language now to be able to actually articulate yourself and, and question them. Then that's when you start to realize how ignorant people can really be and how they are. And, and, and they don't really know much. And they're just going off of rhetoric that they've heard and just repeat, repeating and repeating it over time. Now, you said you haven't been back or ever been to Afghanistan. Is that something that you'd ever want to experience or you've kind of written that chapter out and said no. Um, I definitely would love to experience it. Um, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of sadness. There's a lot of pain around it. And then with the ongoing conflict, like that wasn't something that I thought was going to be happening. Like, right. Like I didn't know that, okay, my parents led through a decade of trauma here. And then after that, September 11th, that led to another 20 years of occupation and war and violence and uncertainty. Right. And then they, I think in 2021 or something, they pulled out the military. And then once again, the Taliban regime like inflated again. And there was, so it was just like, it's a place on earth that's under war and crisis and like one of the poorest countries. So it's always like, in that trauma space, I would say. Yeah. Um, I would love to visit it for sure. I just pray for peace so that uh, I feel a little safe if I do go. And I know people are safe. Like there's I have family members that have gone in things. But um, for me, I needed to do a lot of healing to kind of get to a place of being able to do that. Right, right. Now, I know it's it seemed like we started off in dark space um, with this conversation. But I'm curious you looking back now, what were some of the benefits of how you were raised? I, I love that question. Um, and it's part of the dancing warrior. Like, so she takes the medicine out of the, the pain. And um, 
for me, I think that that's where the concept of resilience comes in. That's where like that self-leadership comes in. Like, I don't think those things would be activated in me where I would be in search of who am I outside of like somebody giving me an identity. I find like if you are raised in a identity where you don't question it, where it doesn't like be problematic and stuff, you might just take on somebody else's script without realizing that you're living out a reality that may not be yours, but you just think you're doing what you, who you think you are. Um, for me, not belonging and not fitting in forced me to figure out what belonging truly meant for me, forced me to find it in ways that are beyond nationalistic. So I don't identify myself as a, you know, I'm Canadian or I'm this, and then I see myself as separate from other human beings from other places. Um, it's, it's given me a much bigger identity, a very like cosmic kind of identity of like, yeah, we all belong on earth. Like we should all have a space to feel welcome here. How dangerous is it, in your opinion, like how dangerous is it to to be on this planet and actually living out someone else's script? I mean... <laughs> it, I, like as I hear you say it, it's scary, right? And I, I'm, I'm aware of that because I do pay attention to that. When people ask certain questions that they see on social media or anything like that, I always ask, well, is that your opinion or... Did you get that from somewhere else and now you're delivering it as if it was your own? Because right. did you have the original thought? If you didn't, then there's something to be questioned there. And why did that piece of information stay with you long enough that you want to share it with me and present it to me? So I always question it from that perspective sometimes. And so that's why I'm asking, because it can be scary when people don't even recognize that the script that they're living out isn't theirs. Right, right. Yeah. Um Ooh, it's a big one because <laughs> uh, I've had a lot of friends who are in their 40s now who got to this place in their life. They were like, well, I was doing what I thought I was supposed to be doing. And they got to this place, you know, they have financial success, they achieve business success, this, that, but they're empty inside and they feel a sense of sadness. They're like, I achieved everything I thought I was supposed to achieve. So um, I don't know if it's so much danger as, as, as there might be grief. Mm. um of like a sadness because time is not something that we can kind of get back and so authenticity for me is a really big thing like living by your soul's voice or soul's song is really important to me versus uh doing things and a lot of the times we feel like we have to do things just from a place of fear right. um fear of being punished fear of being isolated fear of being excluded um so it takes a lot of courage i would say to mm. Uh, to, to, to find your own stories yeah. and to create them. Now, I, I want to shift a little bit to your parents. We spoke briefly about them, but I'm curious, how would you describe them? Let's start there. How would you describe your parents? I love that. Okay. <laughs> if, I, if it was my younger selves, they might have described them differently. Yeah, um, yeah. My current self, I've done a lot of work around this, so... Mm. I see them as, um, like, I see them as warriors. I see them as legendary and in the sense of who they are as human beings. Like, if I was to, like, detach myself as, like, their child, um, for them to be able to overcome what they overcame, to do what they did. So I see that. Um, but there was a lot of neglect. So a lot of trauma. They've gone through a lot of trauma. So I would say they were pretty wounded, Um they were in, back then, I would say. And, uh, and by now, I feel like they're in a better place. But... Um, that to me was, that to me was a really big thing was dealing with the neglect and the abandonment because my parents divorced and part of that, you know, yeah. um, the absence, the absence of fatherhood or whatever was like a really big theme. It's really important. Um, but when you do a lot of the healing work, you realize that they may not have had some of those things that they couldn't pass down to you. So I would say they're resilient, hardworking, determined, um, but also wounded and yeah. Uh, human. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Now, so if you, looking back now, I want you to picture yourself as that young girl, um, young woman back then. What impact did they have on you then? And then I want you to share with us what impact they have on you today. Yeah. Um, I would say with not having a father growing up, it had a lot of impact on me around my sense of self-worth, uh, my relationship with men and the masculine. Um, so those are two big impacts, I would say, a big time for me. Um, trusting the masculine was a big one, too, of like, 
<laughs> it was a very much like a fear based relationship. Wow. Um, with <laughs> and I, I have so much co- I have compassion when I share this because growing up, uh, growing up, you know, to, with a single mother. Um, I know a lot of other young people in my same neighborhood that, you know, is the same issues that they're going through. So it's it's one of those things that's like it marks a generation of society or like an, a segment of society. Yeah. Um, and with my mom, she was really hardworking and stuff like she was hustling, working several jobs because, you know, they had to work cash jobs um, under the table to like make ends meet, doesn't know the language, all of that. Um, but there was neglect. There was emotional neglect because, uh, you know, like if you've gone under trauma, your heart kind of gets closed. And so you're not really available to your children with the loving, nurturing emotions as much. Right. It might be more of the disciplinary, like, make sure you get things done, make sure you succeed, da, da, da. Um, so my younger selves, um, I would say they had to really uh, pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and like be their own parent from a very young age. And like, I just accepted it. I was like, this is reality. (laughs) Right, right, right. This is the norm, right? Yeah. So you had, you said four sisters? Yes. That's including you or you you make number five? Yes. Wow. And then two brothers? Yeah. So what's your relationship like with all your siblings? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and, and before you get to that like where do you fall in the totem pole like are you I'm the last oh you're the baby yeah. oh my gosh I want to know about this how did that work <laughs> wow uh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize you were the baby that's that's that changes a lot too yeah, I had to fight my way, I would say. I had to fight a lot. I, yeah. I, was such a, I was such a little warrior when I was growing up. I had to know how to, like, hold my own because... <laughs> yeah, because they're much Your older. Brother. They're fending for themselves. They're not really paying attention to you. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so, like, for example, like, the men dominated the remote control in my household. So, like... <laughs> Yep. So, so now people ask me, now people ask me, like, what do you want to watch? And sometimes I have trouble with the remote control. I know that sounds like a, such a silly story, but like there it's because of that, yeah. that I, I just was like, okay, fine. Take the remote. I yeah. don't care about TV. Like I have to like be like, I don't care about this anymore as a way to deal with it. And now people are like, you didn't watch movies when you grew up. Like you didn't watch this. You don't know that. You don't know that. And I'm right, like, right. I just had to learn to find another recreation activity that was wow. aside from the TV. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> but it's a real struggle. I know that struggle. Your brother usually often we scrapped over the remote. Yeah, he's, he's older by two years, and but it didn't matter. We, I took my lumps, but I had to let him know we got to fight sometimes. <laughs> you just... <laughs> you got to do it, man. You got to do it. <laughs> you know, you got to stand your ground sometimes. Let him know. Okay. The little brother's getting a little bit tougher. Okay, okay. You know, give up the control sometimes. So I, yeah. I definitely empathize with you on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, with my sisters, I've I've usually been pretty good. I feel um, unfortunately I don't talk to one of them anymore. And I think you know when you grow up as an adult, like as a child, your reality is really different. And as an adult, you start to accept things, and you're like, you know, we're human beings, and we go through things. I know they say like family's bigger than, or like thicker than blood, and statements like that, but. I also know as an adult, you have to confront realities of Mm -hmm. human beings. And so um, I I would say I have fairly good relationships with most of them, for sure. And even the person that I don't talk to, like, I have mad love for her, like, ultimately, at the end of the day. So I understand distance and things like that, if Mm -hmm. it's required sometimes in life. Um, But yeah, I would say... Um, I have a pretty good relationship and I, one of the things that I love the most is being a, an auntie. Mm. Um, I have a lot of like nieces and nephews and I feel like I've always had the sense of, um, responsibility as a specific aunt in the family to yeah. like, you know, bring them more joy, bring them more play, bring yeah. them more creativity. Like they're all like, I'm an artist. I'm an artist. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Nice. Now on, on that note, how did you express yourself as a kid? Was art something that was always there for you, or did you discover that later on? 
I would say I discovered art later, like the painting side. Um, I just expressed myself a lot through uh, sports, uh, through extracurricular activities, like, uh, you know, being part of student councils, like anything schools, like any extracurricular activities that schools had, I was like, sign me up, sign me up, yeah, sign me yeah. up, because I came from, so... And part of this is because when I was born in Pakistan, like, I had an awareness that, you know, girls didn't get certain privileges. Like, so I used to go to a school that was an Afghan-led school for Afghan refugees. Mm. But, like, Pakistani national schools was reserved for the boys. Um yeah, and, and there's payment, so it was private school, so you'd have to, ha like, be able to facilitate that through payment, and, like, the girls didn't get that in our family because it was, like, preserved for the boys, so I, when I came to Canada and I realized these resources, I was all on it, because I was like, right. okay, fun, playing team right? sports activities, <laughs> like, Samia. <laughs> oh, pardon my ignorance with this, but what's... The, the Coles Notes version or the backstory to why that came to be, where girls were not allowed to do such activities like sports and things like that. Like, what's the backstory to that? Just this, this you know, a quick Coles Notes version of it. Sure. You mean in, in Pakistan? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so where we grew up, it was like a patch for Afghan refugees. So it wasn't considered as the Pakistani state. So that like that way you don't get considered as a citizen of the nation. Do you know what I mean? So, oh. so that way you don't have, so that's why you won't get rights to be able to go to their uh. private schools. Um, and so you have to pay for the private school. So my family, like there was, there's a gender stereotype of privileging the male because the assumption is that the man has to be the breadwinner and provider for the household. So he has to get the education equipped, like, you know, as part of his thing. Uh, and females, the assumption was that you would just get married and you would have a man take care of you. So we did, like my mom still pushed for education, but it was more of like the free, uh, Afghan version of it. Um, so yeah. And so to your to your knowledge and understanding, is that still that system still in place today? That uh, so yes, to an wow. extent for some of them. And then the Taliban recently have been closing schools for girls. So like right. they with the recent regime, they were like, let's get it let's get them out and all of that. So there is the push for that ideology still, um, mm. big time. And absolutely, if you come from low income or if you don't have resources, then you're definitely going to not have the, the girls go to school uh, oh, wow. as part of their thing. So, wow. Yeah. That's, that's, it, it blows my mind every time I hear those stories because I, I think I, I used to believe that time would change everything um, with enough time, right? But Sometimes certain things are still in place, and it makes me question that theory that I have sometimes. So, uh, class is important. So, if you, I, I would say people who have wealthier like backgrounds, they mm -hmm. would probably promote their kids to go outside of the country to right. to study abroad, right? right. So, like, there, if you have money, you can do more things. But right. if you don't have money, then you use your money in a very strategic way to kind of play the rules of the society, and those were the rules of society at that time. So. Uh, when I came to Canada, I recognized my privileges and I recognized, you know, where I was going to take opportunity. And my mom really stressed the value of education for us, especially the girls, because mm. she's like, I didn't have a chance to go to school. I want to make right. sure you guys take that seriously. Right. Wow. Now, yeah. was there a lesson in these adolescent years, you know, going through middle school, high school and all those years that you learned early on that still kind of st sticks with you today? so many lessons um wow basketball so i used to play basketball and so i okay so in high school i had the identity because of where i grew up uh i grew up in like public housing but the high school that i went to kids from public housing would go so like the poor class mm -hmm. and then the super rich class from <clears throat> from the beaches so like as you know right. like the beaches community in toronto is where multi-million dollar homes and things like that right yeah so you would see the disparity, like, just by going into the space. And uh, I had to learn to navigate two worlds, which is the world of education, because I knew that was the path to success. And then I also had to navigate the streets. Mm. So they have two different codes of success. And you have to be able to embody both of those. And so I did embody both of those. I had to be, like, the quote-unquote gangster girl on the street. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hold on, hold on. Talk to me about that right now. <laughs> who is this gangster? I want to know who this gangster is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I've, I, I've been suspended before. I used to get into fights. Wait, like, so you were a scrapper? Yes. Which makes sense because you got to fend for yourself. I got it. I got it. Yes. I'm with you. <laughs> um. And, you know, there's, like, a dominance thing that it's so horrible to say. Like, when I look back now that I'm, like, damn, like, that's 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 so harsh. But, like, that is survival. That is what yeah. I'm talking about. Like, the street code, if you don't make a name for yourself and, like, consider yourself the top of the pack. I know that sounds horrible to say, but that, oh, that's, that's what I knew. That's My the psychology, reality then. yeah, yeah. Right? Like, so it's, like, if you want to survive in the streets, you have to show your power. And you have to, like, even for the women, they adopted a lot of these, like, toxic ways of being yep. um, of power. And so that's who I was on the street. I've gotten in trouble with cops for, like, stupid shit. <laughs> and, like, nothing on the record, but yeah. just, like, you know, thankfully they were, like, nice enough to, like, let me go because they were, like, you don't make sense. Like, yeah. how yeah. are you this on paper and right. how are you this on the street? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to survive, man. That's what it is. Yep. That's exactly yeah. what it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I feel like I've experienced a lot of the stereotypes of you know, girl growing up with a single mother household and yeah. all that. Like, there's all those stats, and it's very true, like, that you can fall into more of those, like, teenage pregnancies, yeah. like, you know, a lot of those things. But I also had this, like, mindset of perseverance. Um, I used to play basketball, and I think, like, sports really helped me, to, like, put on that, like, winning mindset. Mm. And I carried that with me because I was like, I want a good life for myself. And yeah. so... I wasn't going to let these obstacles kind of take me down and like put me in a box and make me act out the cycles of poverty, the cycles of trauma. Like that was a really big thing I would say I learned from those ages. Nice. Now, how would your peers, not the peers in the street, I want to know about the positive peers, right? The peers, how would they describe you back then? If I were to speak um, to them today, what would they say about Sahara back then? <laughs> uh, that I was, I would say that they would, they would probably call me goofy, but also fun because nice. I used to be like the partier, but like I would, like I kind of get people hyped up, like mm. I would, you know, and I would be silly, so like they could feel comfortable around me and they could like allow their silliness to come out. Yeah. Um. So when I reflect back and I think about like my friendships, like I, I really think I'm very silly. Like I'm, I'm. I have like a funny, silly aspect of myself that like inspires other people to, to be there. So now how has your circle of friends over the years changed? Ooh, big time. <laughs> <laughs> In what areas though? Like, so people that you'd hang out with to socialize with, how has that group changed? And then people that you actually just want to have more of a, um, like a real relationship with, not just those that I hang out with or go to, go out for drinks with or any of that. I'm talking about, you know, those real conversations, somebody you can call and lean on. How have those circles also changed over the years? Um, so I still have my best friend from when I was 10 years old. Uh, so we've been friends for like 23 years and we check in all the time. And so I feel like that relationship has been a very cool one that's allowed me to go through my different phases of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, I still have my crew of like friends from like my neighborhood when I grew up as a teen. Like we literally have a WhatsApp group still. Uh, yes. We're called like the OGs. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> you can't let the streets go, huh? <laughs> you can't. You can't. <laughs> so, so I have that group of friends. But then I feel like I've also opened up to other communities. I'm very much into, like, personal growth, spirituality, art, and, like, creativity for transformation and empowerment. So I feel like I have a lot of circles of friends in those areas. But yeah. a lot of them are digital. And um, I also just i am always wanting to make new friends. So... Uh, yeah. Nice, nice. Now, thinking back when you were in high school, what did you want to be? What was one of your your dreams and aspirations? Professionally, what did you want to be? That's a really good question. In high school, huh? I know when I was in grade 7 and 8, I wanted to be like a scientist, an inventor, and a WNBA player. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, I like that. That's, that's, that's 7, right? Grade 7? Yeah. So that in high school, it probably 
changed drastically because now you're in the streets too. So what happened there? <laughs> Absolutely. So high school, I, I was a very, uh, I was, I, I, I feel like my 14 and 15 and 16 were kind of depressing years, I would say. Like I was not. Rebelling. And they were, yeah, they were, there was just, and I partied a lot for sure. I had a part-time job. I, you know, I did the teenager thing. Mm. Uh, your emotions are developing differently at that time. So you're going through dating yeah. and like, that's a whole new world. And so I yeah. feel like that's who I was exploring in my high school age more so was like the part of your side, the dating side of me, the, uh, so I don't think I was really even focused on dreams of right. professions. Like I wasn't driven by like, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. So yeah, a lot of my innocence died out in my in my high school years. <laughs> it's, but it's interesting you say that because I, I had a lot of friends um, and I went through a period like that myself where we lose hope or direction, right? Or a sense of direction because we you got so distracted with what our friends were doing at the time and what was cool or what was interesting to us at the time. And so mm-hmm. it's almost like you kind of deviate off your path Mind you, it was never really your path. It was your parents' path, right? But you, you get my point. You, you yeah. deviated off of it, and all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, I'm in grade 11. Something's got to give. I got to go into, you know, post-secondary in a year. What do I want to do? And we hit that wall. Did you find yourself in that situation at all or no? Yeah, I took, uh, so I took a year off before, after high school, I took a year off before going to university. Yeah. Um. I was a nerd and I knew marks mattered, so I did go back for a semester to upgrade some grades just so that I could get scholarships. Yeah. Uh, but I also needed to take some time to think about, like, who, what am I going into? Like, I didn't just want to go to pick any degree, waste money, waste time. Like, my sister, she was, like, the canary. Uh, you know when they say, like, you lead a canary into the yeah. thing and yeah. let them test it out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So my sister was a test for me because I would be like, you go and take those steps and I'll follow if it's safe. <laughs> That's the streets right there. That's the streets talking. <laughs> so so oh, she was gosh. studying. Yeah, and so I, I witnessed that in their first year, they just like, it was a wash for them. She was just like, honestly, I don't know. I don't like, so I was just like, I didn't want my first year to be a wash. So I like learned from experience yeah. of my sisters. Yeah. Um, and I, I was interested, so I did find out, like, the program that I studied was, like, really aligned with me. It was international development. Mm. Um, and I really wanted to have some answers to questions because I'm like, history and Canadian history doesn't teach me about my history. Right. Like, how, how do I understand what happened? So this kind of takes us to where we started this conversation on this podcast episode, yeah. Yeah. Uh, where I was still in question of, like, what happened? How do I understand my history? How do I yeah. understand my family? How do I understand, like, my place in this world? Because I didn't, I was still qu- figuring out that sense of belonging and sense of peace and all of that. So, yeah. Right. So that's interesting, because that leads us right into my next question. How did you end up in at Harmony Movement? What led you there? Because yeah. my next question after that is going to be, you know, how well did you know yourself during that period where we met? Right. So I've been with Harmony since, or I was with Harmony since 2009. So um, when I started, so I was in teacher's college. Um, and so part of our teacher's college was we had to do community service time with an organization that served the community, but education as well. Oh. Um, so that was an organization that I picked randomly, like we were given an option of different ones. And so we got to pick where, and so by, it was by chance that I picked mm. that organization, but it was beautiful because it impacted me on so many levels after that. So yeah. that's that's where I started. And so during those years, because you were there from 09, right? Yeah. So I met you in pretty 14. much 2014. Yeah. So what would you say about, you know, Sahar then during that period, uh, even before I came into the picture? I'm just curious. Did you feel like you knew yourself a little bit more than you did coming in? Before, sorry, before coming into Harmony Movement? Yeah, like the, now, since you've been there since 09 until, let's say, the five years, how well did you develop as far as that identity piece that you've been searching for? Did that help being there? Did it help you because of the programs they offered and that you had to deliver? 
did you find that you were learning a little bit more about yourself and just questioning the world differently and so forth? Like, was that helpful or? Big time, big yeah. time. So I went into teacher's college with the hope to inspire a change. And I know it sounds very cliche. And I was like, I'm going to teach history and I'm going to teach history. You'd like to include all the things that they've included that they haven't because history is very powerful, right? Like who gets yeah. to tell the story? And they say like the winners get to tell the story or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm saying that in air quotes. Yeah. Um, and like whose stories get like isolated or exiled or whatever and whose stories get included. And so I thought I was going to go into schools and create change. Um, I was very passionate at that time. I was very like inspired. I was very focused on like this identity of, of being a transformer. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Harmony Movement helped me in so many ways because it really showed me, like, justice work. Like, I was like, wow, this is decolonizing type of work. Like, at that time, I was interested in education for the purpose of liberation of, like, your mind and your spirit so you can really see yourself as an empowered person and not according to the stories and mirrors that are shown to us that are disempowering and things like that, right? Right. Um, And I would say it had huge impact on me because it took me to this point in curriculum around identity to realizing like internalized self-hate that was huge for me it was huge for me um and it's one thing to do the work logically like through your mind and it's another to feel the impact of something and i know in most of our educational settings we honor the mind but we don't realize the emotional embodied impact of some of these things that we unpack sorry before you continue can you give me a yeah. bit of a tip? I'm just curious with what you just said. How do I, so for me, how do I tap into what it, how it makes me feel, right? Because you're right, it is logical. Everything is mostly on, about the mind, it's from the mind. And so if I'm the one leading such a session or anything related to identity, how do I allow myself to kind of tap into that space and still be able to, um, you know, lead the group? Or, or be able to follow the group because sometimes the, the group has to lead, right? Based on where I'm at and where they are. So, like, right. what do you do that helps you tap into that feeling? So, the modalities that I use are important. So, I use painting. So, I, I went into uh, becoming an intentional creativity coach and teacher in 2014, actually, that same year that I was, it was my final year at Harmony. That's right. Um, right. And so, I realized the modalities that we were using, we needed to use modalities that were more transformative and helpful. So I find with painting that, um, oh, wow. So I had this, I had this, uh, I'm just getting this download. I'm going to give you a story so to, to demonstrate that. Okay. So I, I facilitated a workshop for a group of young girls called My Art Is Me. And they were to paint the queen of their heart, which is like, so they could identify with themselves from this place of beauty and power and love and all of that. And these were young racialized women. And I knew that society actually portrays these women or like identities for these women in a very like disempowered, weak, poor, et cetera, et cetera, like all the negativity. Right. Mm. So. So one of the participants uh, was painting, and this is about imit- painting themselves. So mm. self-portraits so you can feel you're empowered and you're in charge of your own image. Right. Um, and so this one girl, in her painting, she noticed a tear. So this is her going by intuitive. So in her painting, she noticed a tear. And she, like, gently, like, wiped, like, did a wiping on her painting as a way to create that sense of self-soothing and self-connection. So she painted the tear on there because she noticed it. And then she tried to, like, create the soothing medicine for that part of herself. And to me, like, it was so beautiful. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's Mm -hmm. got to be what I get from it. Correct me if I'm off. But what I get from it is it's got to be actional. It's got to be something that you're doing in order to really tap into that, that feeling because it can't just be up here where you're processing it, right? And action has got to make the connection for you if I'm, if I'm okay with that interpretation. Yeah, and you got to move it out. you got to move the energy yeah. out of your system into something. So that's why we use canvases and paint because it moves it out of your field, out of your system, out of your heart into something outside of you, and then you can work with it. Wow. I never thought of that. I never thought of that. that but it's I, true. Right. Because I find like, well, unpack the wound. And that's what we were doing in a harmony movement is like we would unpack and point to like the pain points and things like that. But we didn't know how to be like, 
okay, so the society then says women of color are X, Y, Z, or this yeah. person is X, Y, Z. So how do I address that? Like, how right. do I respond to that? Wow. So on this journey of healing, because I know it was a big one when, when you left Harmony in 14, and I knew you were pursuing that because it meant so much because you were, like, moved by it. Like, you had to do it. <clears throat> and so I remember that. And I think we connected briefly uh, years after that, and I kind of asked you about it, and, and, you know, you expressed to me that it was great. Now, what did you discover from that period in that journey to now, right? What did you discover about yourself during that healing journey that you took, that you're still on? Oh, um, the biggest thing is, uh, there's so many things I've discovered, but the greatest thing has been self-love and self-love as the antidote to internalize self-hate. Um, in 2012, so I was all doing, so like being a practitioner of like, you know, leadership, education, et cetera, et cetera. I discovered for myself that when I looked in the mirror, I couldn't hold eye contact with myself for longer than a few minutes without hearing what I didn't know back then was called the inner critic, but I would hear this voice that was very negative and mean and harsh start talking to me and making fun of me, putting me down and all of that. So I couldn't even hold the gaze with myself for longer than like two minutes without hearing that voice. And that's when I knew something needed to change. Mm. So that's been a decade or 11 year long journey yeah. of embodying self-love. Wow. Talk to me about intergenerational trauma. You mentioned it earlier. Um, and what does that mean? I understand what it means. I just want you to be able to articulate it to my listeners so they have an understanding of what it is. Um, and how does it impact us? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's a big one. Like, it's, it's, it's huge. And I've had an episode where I kind of um, scratched the surface of it, but... I'm glad that it's something that, you know, you're knowledgeable of it as well. And, and you definitely, you're still going through it. We all go through it. Um, but yeah, share, share your understanding of it for me and the listeners. Just so we have another perspective, another voice talking about it. Sure. Um, and I hope I do some level of justice to it. So for me, um, my understanding is that things get passed down to us, like from the unconscious in our family lineages. So if things don't get processed by your parents, it kind of passes down to you in a sense. And so um, I want to I want to preface intergenerational trauma alongside intergenerational resilience. So we embody both. Um, but it's important to acknowledge that if you didn't have certain needs met when you were growing up, so this ties to our conversation about like neglect, because neglect is considered under C CPTSD, which is like a complex post-traumatic, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have, if you have parental neglect and like care and things like that, you take on those qualities as ways of being with yourself and you continue to act it out as an adult in your life, Right. So that's why they say, like, reparenting is a really big act of therapy to kind of nourish yourself in the places where you may have had gaps or, like, lack or et cetera. Right. Um, so for me, it's like, okay, I understand, like, with my mom, for example, she had emotional, like, a lot of emotional blockages in terms of not being able to nurture us on a certain level. And I understand as an adult after all this work that I've done to look back and acknowledge that. But so... I want to show up in my family lineage with more love. I know it sounds really lame, but maybe it's not. But these are, you know, wellness, love, wealth, happiness, all these qualities that are in the state of thrival. Yeah. In order for you to kind of get to that energy, you have to address intergenerational trauma because we would continue to be carrying these baggages with us, right? right? And so um, the gift we give our ancestry and lineage is by healing it within ourselves and some people feel a little bit of sense of selfishness or like whatever around like doing inner work because they're like, oh, the world is on fire. I got to go save it. Yeah. But yeah. what 
and that's what I thought I was studying international development for because I was like, I'm going to save the world. Like, you know what I mean? You have this idea, but you're projecting the pain that you're feeling inside onto the, the world like outside of yourself. Yeah. Um, so the way to heal, the way that I've understood to heal a lot of that is by uh, doing it within myself. So as I self-nurture, as I self-love, I know that that's being passed down because my mother didn't have certain tools to pass down to me. She gave me the bare minimum of survival which wasn't just minimum. It was a lot based on what she was able to give me, right? Like, when you look back into, like, what they did, I'm like, I don't know if I could have five kids go through the mountains and still, yeah. still have my mind put together. Like, I can't even get, take care of my dog. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Man, the way you said that, it sounds like we're so weak and fragile this, in this era. We are. We are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I really feel that. And so, you know, there's this Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and he has, like, the physiology as the base. And so once you can secure your basic needs, then you can start to do the emotional work. So mm. my parents didn't get to the level of the emotional work fully. Yeah. So. I had to take on. So I'm moving my ancestry forward by going to the next level on the actualization pyramid. But it's not just for my own actualization in a selfish way. It's connecting to my bloodline of like, I'm moving forward this, this, this lineage of mine in that way. So yeah. how do you, how do you stay motivated, inspired when you look at this world <laughs> that we're in right now? Like what, what allows you to stay so, you know, positive and, and, and whatnot? Oh, so I I do believe there's so much love on this planet. I believe there's so much joy. There's so much beauty. There's so much goodness. Like it's all of that is here. All of it is available to us. Um, and like, I, and I know it's 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 so weird for me to say that when you guys probably heard the start of this episode being so dark and heavy and painful and, <laughs> <laughs> and all of that is like, how did that happen? Um, <laughs> but you know, I've had to do like eleven years of deep work like 11 years of trauma healing and that's that's the value of healing is you get to a vibration of joy meaning it's i'm not faking it you know what i mean and um i think it was the dalai lama or someone that said people who experience true joy have experienced deep suffering Mm -hmm. so suffering and joy coexist side by side on this planet and in this world and like i definitely acknowledge it and i'm not you know oblivious to it and pretend like racism doesn't exist or this doesn't exist like i don't i don't tuck my head in the sand but you know and that's why it goes back to this piece of like the dancing warrior embodying the dancing warrior is like we have to actively embody joy we have to actively seek love we have to actively nurture beauty and i think that's where my artist identity comes into play so much of like uh, it's the medicine and it's my it's my weapon to to fight against a lot of the suffering and pain and all of that i love that the dancing warrior it's going to stick with me now I love that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Determination and perseverance. I, I can hear it in your story. Um, what do those words mean to you today and how do they apply um, to this, you know, Sahara that we're speaking with? So those two words I wrote in my journal in 2012, and that's when I started to go down the path of life coaching because I was like, I'm going to learn transformational leadership and help people to step into their like leadership energy and things like that. So I've always been inspired and motivated by self-leadership and self-management. I think you have to be your greatest like champion, your greatest lover. Like You have to fight for you, meaning you have to want goodness for your life. Right. And so... Um, that's been what's pushed me to get to where I am right now and what's inspiring me to continue to grow and flourish because, um, you know, I remember myself going through the years, but I always had a vision in mind of my success. So I, I, to the listeners, like, you have so much power in you, and I know we can get defeated and we can have wounds and we can have pain and we can have trauma, but we also have this, like, really powerful warrior in us that has the ability to show us the way that has connection to source energy, whatever your sense of faith might be, you know? Like, yeah. I don't, I've never done things by myself. I've always had to rely on on faith and prayer and all of that. Yeah. Um, and things, and, and the universe has showed support to me in all these ways by, like, showing up and bringing me the resources that I need and things. But I've also had to show up to that energy myself, too. So 
Don't accept defeat. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. And I think what what you just said is very critical because we show up often for others, but not for ourselves. Big right. Time. So you got to show up for yourself, and I think that's important to take away too. Um, You've alluded to this earlier when you were talking about, you know, the life in the streets and you're just banging out there, beating up the girls and getting yourself uh, acquainted with, <laughs> with the police. <laughs> I still can't get that image out of my head because that's like far left for me. Right. From who I know. Right. <laughs> yeah. But but I believe it because of the times that we were in back then as well. Now, explain to me the survival state. And then I want you to talk about a thrival because you mentioned that earlier. And I want to kind of, kind of get you to kind of expand on that a little bit more. Sure. So I've become like a health wellness like nerd person because I had like a burnout in 2021 um, from work uh, and from stress. And uh, but I've always been in this question of like understanding stress and understanding wellness and all this. So survival state has an impact where you're under chronic stress all the time. You're in a state of fear. You're worried about if you're going to like stay alive. And so for a lot of people who experience poverty, our nervous system is impacted. Like our gut health is impacted because we're always, our nervous system is resonating at the energy of fear. It doesn't know if like it's safe to be here. Like, so when you experience trauma, your nervous system gets impacted. And so even if the present moment there's safety, your nervous system's like, there's a lion out there. It's going to get me. (laughs) Oh, wow. Right. And so for, for, and for most people, um, the survival brain is a really old part of our system. It's a human thing. It's not just like specific groups of people, but I do believe that part of our evolution as humanity is to shift out of the survival brain and into the thrival brain, you know? So it's, it's a bigger thing beyond just me, but I'm using myself as a guinea pig to, right. embody, to embody this philosophy and understanding. And so the thrival speaks to what? Like being able to get through or making the switch from survival and then thinking positively and having that impact your nervous system in a different way. Yes. So so there's this thing called the vagus nerve. Uh, it's it, it runs from like your head, the back of your head, all the way down through your system. So it touches all your different systems and it's it like leads at the bottom. Okay. The reason why I mentioned that is because a lot of health issues stem from stress. A lot of health issues stem from uh, like, you know, being in a state of chronic stress or trauma and things like that. Mm-hmm. And so there's a time where we grow up as an adult where our reality is like, okay, I have my basic needs met. I'm safe. I have a home of my own. I have this, that. But your nervous system hasn't caught up. Your your mental beliefs haven't caught up with your current reality. Right. And so thrival state is about letting your body know I'm safe. I'm welcome. I belong. I'm loved. I'm cherished. Like it's letting yourself know all of that. And so that you live in a state of peace and wellness and it's a state of joy. It's a state of play. It's a state of connection. Um, so it's political for me. It's a very political thing to, to get to a state of thrival because I think that that's where my hope is for everybody to be. Mm. Wow. So speaking of thrival, <clears throat> you got your master's. Am I correct with that? Yeah, yeah. So what was that journey like? Because I know, based on what we know so far about you, you went from survival in high school, took that year off, weren't sure what you wanted to do, so, you know, you kind of pushed your sister out there to Canary. (laughs) And then you figured out, okay, this is what I'm going to do. What was accomplishing that master's degree mean or do for you? Like, how did that make you feel? Um, so I was in teacher's college and I dropped out twice and I was a straight A student. So I didn't drop out because I was, you know, bad grades or anything. Um, I dropped out twice because I realized I wanted to make impact at a higher level. I wanted to impact educators. And, uh, because within the system at the level of just being a teacher, I saw a lot of like unhealthy things going on at the staff level that Mm -hmm. I was like, wait, I thought I wanted to change (laughs) teachers, student lives. Nope. But now I'm like, I got to deal with these people because they're the ones that are the power people. So, um, so my plan changed a little bit in that sense. And, um, I thought I was going in to do my master's because I thought I was going to create my own not-for-profit organization that I was going to mm. like facilitate creative leadership education. But the universe had a different plan for me as to why I was there. 
Um, it was a very powerful reason. Uh, I had gone through an experience with a family member and I needed the wisdom around this to like get, get me through. So um, my master's was not what I thought it was for. And mm. I share that because life, you have to listen to your intuition and sometimes you'll be guided to do certain things and you think it might be for like a reason, but it's for a completely different reason and where it ends up landing you. And there's so many blessings and miracles in that. So sometimes it's just for those people who control their reality a little too much. <laughs> yeah. 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 Let go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. go ahead. No, finish that. Finish that story because um, I, I think you're going to tell me about what the masters you thought it was going to do for you and what it ended up doing. Yeah. So it ended up leading me to uh, do my research around this conversation of uh, like early. Uh, it's deep. It's really. It was actually a really, really deep experience. Um, but what it, it brought to me was the piece about mother-child relationships. So, like, mm. back again, early child relationships. Um, and just how do you recover from breakdowns in terms of, like, you know, using words, using art, using creativity as a way. And then it led to this piece that, like, ultimately identity has to be created. So how we tell our stories about who we are, like, we are the storytellers of our lives. And yeah. so... Um, the stories that we tell about ourselves can actually cause us a lot of pain or a lot of joy. So we yeah. have to be really mindful of like, what are the stories that are running in your operating system that you're telling yourself? Um, and then in 2016, um, I got this, like I went to a retreat in California to do like some visioning work. And that's where I got this download. Cause all this time I was doing work with youth. Like I loved right. doing work with youth and children. And I thought that's who my people are. I'm going to protect mm -hmm. them. I'm going to like support them, all yeah. of that. And then I got this like insight that said, you're, it's funny. I just got an email that says insight on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I got it. I got this, this insight that said, okay, you're going to work with adults now. And I was like, what? Like, yeah. I'm scared. Like, how do I make this career change of working right. with adults? Like that, that was like a very trippy thing, but it led me to my current career, uh, where, you know, you had mentioned I'm an instructional designer and, uh, I do what my soul has been wanting to do in my 20s. Like, I'm, I'm so grateful for that. So two things. I want to get back to this career that you just mentioned. But before that, the fear of working with adults. Can you describe that fear? Because the reason why it's important, because I, I think fear is a beautiful tool, right? That if used right, it can be very powerful and empowering. But if misused, it can be very detrimental, to individuals, right? So describe to me what that fear did for you and what was that fear? Is it the fear of, wait a minute, are they older than me? And what can I, you know, um, um, share with them? Or was this something else? Yeah, yeah, it was definitely that that piece of like discredited, them being like, you don't have enough experience for right. me to like trust you. Right. And so I was like, who am I to be teaching adults? Like, right, right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But then you push through it. And here you yes. are, right? Now, talk to me about that, that, this career now. You are literally instructing and developing um, courses. Yeah. It's something that I'm currently in a space where I'm, I'm wanting to transition into, but we'll talk about that um, outside of this episode. I don't want to take your shine away. I'm just curious. Talk to me about that. What does that mean? What does it look like for you on a daily basis and is this something that I didn't even know existed until recently, but is this something that young people can also start thinking about aspiring to become? Oh, big time, big time. Like we're actually creating a program to train people on how to become an instructional designer. Um, so for me, my job feels very soul led, which is really interesting because usually people have a judgment of like, oh, if you go to corporate, you sell your soul. Um, I do think you can create your career and your your soul can guide you to like the different places. And so um, when I graduated with, with my master's, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was like, universe, like show me. I thought I was going to have my own studio. I thought I was going to run a business and all of this stuff. And then I got this download of like curriculum development and I was like curriculum development and I did take a curriculum studies class in my master's. So I was like aware of it in some sense, but not like that, that level. Right. Um, and so 
I was just got this inspiration to apply for this job and I applied for two jobs and I got the first one, which was really fascinating because, you know, you just get out of school, you're so intimidated. Like I was terrified. Like I didn't, it it was a really, like it was an adulting journey for me. Like, you know, um, so I got the job and it's like, I had to learn on the job because there was, you know, I didn't have the skill sets of this before you have to learn it through application and practice. Um, and so I feel really grateful because I ended up working on the child. So, so I used to think that if I could create one post-secondary course in my twenties, I was like, God, like, this is my dream. I would love to be able to create a marketing class or a business class. Like imagine, like, I thought it was such a big deal, like a (laughs) big deal if you could create a post-secondary course. (laughs) And now I've created over a hundred of them and I've met, yeah. And I've managed over eight like diploma level programs I've like I've submitted several level programs I got an like one of my biggest achievements that I'm so grateful for that's like a soul journey like piece is um so we have a child and youth care program and that was a program I used to take care of and manage and like work on and so I had a lot of impacts because impacts important to me right like I always Mm -hmm. make I wanted to make sure when I did that commitment in 2016 of saying okay I'm gonna let go of working with children and youth Mm -hmm that part of me still got to express herself right. in this career because I got to put so much love and power into the curriculum yes. for children and youth workers. Yeah. So I was like, I just kept on being brought up higher and higher in terms of impact. Nice. And I got to put in the, the harmony movement diversity curriculum into the program. And I got their wow. books into the curriculum. Wow. Yeah, so it just brings it wow. all in, right? <laughs> Full circle. Then, yeah, yeah. It was so, it was, I was like, wow, this is so beautiful. So I, I put in a diversity course in that program because I was like, you need this. And then um, I got to receive an articulation agreement. So this college is out in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, uh, like this part of our college. And I got an articulation agreement with the university. So we're one of the first private career colleges that have an articulation agreement with the university where wow. our students will get their diploma through our our college and then get a degree through the university if they do an extra two years there. So I, I feel really, my nerdy self is like, you're cool. <laughs> so, wow, that's, that's very impressive. Congrats. That's huge. Thank that is you. huge. Now, what else... Do you want to influence within this capacity that you hold now? Um, I love what I do. I've been here about five and a half years, and the greatest influence I've had is on faculty heads. So I influence the leadership of faculty heads who are like, you, you just think about the level of impact that is, and it's powerful. And I don't do it for my own power. I do it from a power of love, like yeah. for love, right? Yeah. Um, so I've... I feel like that's the greatest influence is like across different disciplines. I'm able to have impact by putting in these like, you know, soft skills by putting in like wisdom, by putting in like leadership development. So I still do my magic in all these ways um, of like that passionate soul part of me, but in a traditional setting. Wow. Now that's, that's beautiful. I, I didn't even see that part coming. That's why I'm just let her go. Let her go. Yes. Brag. I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> now, I'm in it. We're, we're coming to the end, near the end here. Um, and I have a small segment and we're going to get into that right now. So it's called Would You Rather? I'm going to ask you two. I'm going to give you two silly options and you got to pick one and you got to explain why you chose the option that you chose. OK, you ready? Yeah. <laughs> Would you rather be able to control animals or be able to see into the future? Ooh, see into the future. <laughs> okay, explain. Definitely. What, what would you do with that power? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> so what are some of the things that you would want to see? Is it for your personal future or other people's future? Um, <laughs> I'm a little bit selfish at the moment, so <laughs> go for it. Go for it. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I would say first, I need to see into my own because I don't know. Like right. right now, I'm in a brand new place in my reality where I'm like, I have no idea what life holds in store for me, yeah. and I don't want to control it. So I would first want to see my own. I would say, mm-hmm. um, 
Yeah, because I, I don't want to be, like, crossing other people's boundaries, you know? I, right. I feel like I want to have respect for other people's lives and journeys. So I don't want to be this, like, arrogant, egotistical person that's like, I'm going to use my superpowers <laughs> to save the world. <laughs> I won't, but I'll, I will I will create a business. That will say, I offer this as a service, so if you're uh, interested, by your will, you can come and work with me, and then we'll go. see what your future holds. I like that. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I usually throw that in there just to kind of shake things up and, and lighten it up a little bit, because um, we're nearing the end of our conversation. But a few questions for you. If you could improve two areas in your life, what would they be? Hmm. My eating, so cooking. <laughs> <laughs> the big one. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so I would say that. And then I feel like I would love to be more involved in the world, like publicly. Like I would love to share my gifts a lot more. I would love to have I, – I know I have impact through my college job and things like that, but there's a part of me that's like yearning to connect with more people internationally right. and just like impact people's lives directly. So I would say like that would be another one, my soul work. Okay. Now what's next for Sahar? What's your next chapter looking like? Ooh, <laughs> um, I'm hoping it includes a partner. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, I I think I do hope to have a family as well as part of a part of my dreams for the next little while. Mm -hmm. Um, and definitely, um, definitely soul work. More of my soul work. Like I'd love to write some books if possible. Um, I'd love to support other leaders. Like one of my biggest passions is to help leaders activate their gifts, like create their programs, bring their vision into life. Nice. Um, I love inspiring people. So those would be, I think, some of the things that I'd focus on. Man. And where do you see yourself as a whole in five years? Either professionally, you kind of mentioned personally. Um, is there anything that you see changing within or that you'd like to see change in the next five years for yourself? I would love to come into self-certainty more, like to know my voice, like know my my own leadership. Um, one of the things I'm always inspired by is people who are visionaries and who like do their own thing and they know it's their thing. You know, like yeah. I have a lot of teachers who who do their work through their businesses and I'm like, damn, like that's so amazing that you trust yourself that much. That's so amazing that like you vouch for yourself that hard. So I hope in the next five years, I just come into more of that, like, integrated self-love. And because I, I know that who I am is in service for other people from a place of love. I just want to be more of myself. That's it. That's it. That's it. And how can others connect with you to learn more about not just you, but your healing process and the journey and, you know, maybe get some insights on uh, initiatives that you're involved in that they can support? Is there anything that you're doing that you'd love for people to, you know, get behind and, and kind of you know, put it out there and support it? Sure. Um, they can follow me on Instagram if they want to connect there. I feel like that's a place where I, I kind of am more active. Okay. Um, and we can post, I guess, the link of it as part of the description. Yeah. Um, and so I'd say Instagram is probably the best place that I'm most active to connect with. Awesome. And what's your handle on there? Um, so it's art underscore of underscore Sahar J. Okay. So I'll make sure I get that in the description as well. But I just wanted to make sure you said it as well. Um, and could you share an important life lesson that you've learned recently? Oh, so that's a tough one. <laughs> It depends on who I'm speaking with, right? Like, yeah. if I'm speaking to an adult, it's different than if I'm speaking to a teen. So I want to preface that. Yeah. Um, if I am speaking to adults, then I would say, um, ooh, that's a tough one. I would say, uh, yeah, it's, that's a tough one. Ooh. <laughs> that's a tough one. So the biggest thing I would say is to be connected to your soul voice, like, to really know that like adulting and leadership are tied together in that way. And so do the work of figuring out who you are as a soul, because we're not just our trauma. We're not just our wounds. We're not the stories that we tell ourselves from that victim standpoint. So I would say like discover who your victor is if possible. 
Nice. And what's the most recent book that you've read? This one is just me being selfish because I like to collect books. So. <laughs> uh, the Mountain is You is a really good one. And that's by Brianna Weiss, I believe. So that's one of the most recent ones I've read. The I'm Mountain listening. is You? Yeah. All right. I got to put that on my list. Make sure I grab that. Now, really good. finally, finally, how would you want to be remembered when it's all said and done? And why? Ooh. Um, that as a contribution, I would love to be an asset in people's lives. I would love to be profitable in people's lives, meaning that like their interaction and relationship with me has helped to improve their world versus like take away from it. So my gosh, thank you so <laughs> much. Thank you. So that was awesome. Um, listen, before I let her go, I just want to say thank you guys for continuing to tune into the show and make sure you like subscribe. And if you gained a lot, which I think you did, cause I know I did, I gained a lot of value and great content from this conversation. Um, you can also check out the show on YouTube, um, at the DAP show and link again is going to be in the description until next episode, love, peace and nappiness.